Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all-mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, and I'm uh, really glad you decided to be here today, part of our Saturday. Um, let you know if you're new to AMC Mailbag, this is a lot more laid-back and formal kind of show. We'll talk about some different things, and we'll talk about some behind-the-scenes stuff and just take a lot easier and uh, things like that. And we're trying something new today that I'm uh, nervous about. Yeah, nervous is a better word than excited, but I'm nervous about, but I'll let you in on that in a second. Uh, hey, listen, before we get into the questions that you guys sent in today, a couple of housekeeping items that I want to make sure you guys are aware of. Uh, number one is if you have not checked it out yet, um, we just launched a new show on AMC Movie News that um, I, I know I have been working on for a couple years um, and uh, that we've been wanting to do for a very long time, but we wanted to figure out how to do it right and things like that. And that show that we launched is AMC I, AMC Independent. The show is actually called AMC Indie Spotlight. And um, we're very, very excited about it and, you know, very, very proud of it. Because, you know, the thing about AMC Movie Talk, our Monday through Friday show, is that by choice and very purposefully, we focus on the big wide release films. You know, the films that will absolutely be playing in a theater near you regardless of where you live. And um, that's what we focus, that's what AMC Movie Talk is. It focuses on wide release films. And we certainly do talk about some independent films and indie films once in a while, but clearly the focus of Movie Talk is the bigger wide release films. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that we covered more than just that. And at AMC, we've had this program called AMC Independent for a very long time, for, for a couple of years now, that I'm very proud of, um, in that we've like got dedicated like over 60 screens across the country, just dedicated to playing independent film. I think you know, the, the official tagline of AMC Independent is the stories of the world brought to your neighborhood. And one of the old taglines of it used to be like, bringing independent film to where people actually go to watch movies. And uh, I'm very, very proud of AMC and, uh, and the AMC Independent Program, the people that run that. And we wanted for a while to make sure we had an outlet to talk about this incredible world of independent film. And we knew that AMC Movie Talk wasn't the right venue for that. So we wanted to start a new show specifically about that. And we kind of decided that a couple years ago. And things really started to heat up about six months ago uh, where we were talking about how do we do AMC independent films? How do we focus on independent films? And we decided on AMC Indie Spotlight, we wanted to do a show that was kind of like AMC Movie Talk, but quite different in that it completely focuses on the world of independent film and those people that make independent film. And, you know, we started talking about, you know, do we hire this type of a person to run it? Do we hire this type of a person to run it? And ultimately, I said, you know what, we've got somebody on the crew already who is very passionate about indie film, knows an awful lot about indie film, and would be really, really excited to do something like this. And that's Amy Rose Eisenbach, our senior editor of Movie News here at AMC Movie News. And so uh, I approached Amy Rose, said, would this be something that interests you? She freaked out. She goes, are you kidding me? And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we launched. We've, we're two episodes in now. And I got to tell you guys, I could not be more proud of Amy Rose and uh, and uh, and Alicia Malone co-hosted with her, and they brought in already a slew of great guests to be on. If you are at all into independent film, you've got to check out AMC Indie Spotlight. Now, one of the other things that you'll notice is that AMC Indie Spotlight is not on our AMC uh, regular AMC Movie News channel. Like all of our other shows are on one YouTube channel. We created a completely independent YouTube channel for uh, AMC Indie Spotlight because not only, unlike our other shows, not only do we have the show AMC Indie Spotlight, but we also chop that show up into segments like we do with AMC Movie Talk. And we didn't want to over flood inboxes um, with people who subscribe to us with, you know, AMC Movie Talk and all of its segments and AMCI and all of its segments. And, you know, it's, it's probably going to be the most unique different show that we do because we're launching a bunch of other shows, and I'll keep you up to date on that as we go, but AMC Indie Spotlight is definitely the most unique, and so we created a unique YouTube channel for it, and I want to encourage you to go and subscribe to it. If you're at all interested in independent film, you can find it on youtube.com slash AMC Independent. So that's youtube.com slash AMC Independent, and that's where you can subscribe to our AMC uh, Independent channel, 
And uh, like I said, I couldn't be more proud of how uh, Amy Rose and Alicia uh, are doing with that right now. And, you know, it's, it's just everything we wanted it to be. And I'm really proud of it. And you should definitely go check it out. Okay, <clears throat> so that's one piece of housekeeping. I got a second piece of housekeeping we got to get to uh, before we go into the questions today. Uh, and that is about mailbag. Some of you who follow me on social media, and for those of you who don't follow me on social media, why don't you follow me? For those of you that do follow me, I have no idea why you do, but if you follow me on social media, I kind of let people who follow me, uh, which by the way, you can follow me on Twitter or follow me on Facebook, wherever, or at Instagram, whatever, just at John Campia, which you can see there. But I let people know before anybody else uh, who follow me on social media that we are indeed taking AMC Mailbag daily. It's going to become a daily show. And, um, you know, part of it is this is going to be a, a huge amount of work. Um, we're actually heading into a, we're heading into phase three. You know, phase one of AMC Movie News was in our Burbank studio <clears throat> just with AMC Movie Talk. We went into phase two where we moved into the stream studio and started uh, mailbag and had higher production value and all that kind of stuff. And we're getting ready to head it. We're already talking a lot about phase three and what's coming up uh, in the next couple of months. And a daily AMC mailbag is a part of phase three. Actually, we're going to be doing three shows every day. We're going to be doing AMC Movie Talk. We're going to be doing AMC Mailbag. And we're going to be doing a weekly show every day. We're going to have five weekly shows. Um, and I'll get into what those shows are, uh, you know, in the coming weeks. But we decided to do AMC Mailbag daily because, uh, you know, you guys really seem to like Mailbag. I know I love doing Mailbag. Um, and we love having the opportunity to be more interactive. And here's one of the things that can make the daily Mailbag kind of unique, all right? <laughs> so the daily Mailbag uh, is going to be a little bit different from the weekend Mailbags because... What we want the daily mailbag to be is we're, we want to take any questions that you send. So any questions are fine. But what I'm really excited about is if you watch AMC Movie Talk, you know, earlier in the day and during AMC Movie Talk, you hear Dennis say, oh, I don't know, say Dennis say, you know what? I really think that, I don't know, uh, Neil Blomkamp is going to blow up to be one of the best directors in Hollywood. So I, this is all, Dennis didn't say that, I'm just making up a scenario here, okay? Well, let's say that you're watching AMC Movie Talk that day, and you really disagree with Dennis, and you wish you were sitting with him to say, oh, but Dennis, you're not taking this into consideration, right? Well, what the Daily Mailbag will be is not just for regular questions, but an opportunity for you to send in your comments based on that day's movie talk. It doesn't have to be that day's movie talk. It can be a movie talk from a few days before. So let's say we're on, we're on movie talk and Dennis makes that comment. And you're like, darn it, I want to send in a message. And, and you can send in a message that says, hey, I want to make a comment about something that Dennis says. Dennis on movie talk said that he thinks Neil Blomkamp is going to blow up to be the next big director. But he's not taking into consideration that Neil Blomkamp said in this interview in Time Magazine that he's only going to direct for two more years. Which, by the way, is not true. I'm just making that up, okay? Um, but let's say you knew that and you heard about that and that's an actual fact and you wanted to call in and make that, that comment. Well, I just kind of gave the other part away. The other unique thing about um, Mailbag Daily is that we are going to not just take your emails, but we are now setting up a way for you to call in. Now, it's not going to be live, but <clears throat> as you can see, we're going to test with this episode of Mailbag today. Um, you guys can actually call in and leave your question or your comment or whatever. And we have set up an AMC mailbag hotline, which we are testing out. This is just don't don't call this number Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Okay, this is just we're just testing this out right now for the weekend mailbags. Um, for as we're building up to doing the daily mailbags, we're going to be taking a lot of the calls. But if you want to get your question or comment in for tomorrow's mailbag, like for Sunday's mailbag. Try calling in your message to 818-934-0228. Once again, that's 818-934-0228. Now, if you're calling internationally, whatever, you're more than free to call. But remember, you're going to have uh, international long distance charges and things like that will apply as if you're making any phone call to out here. Okay, We don't cover the charges of your phone call. Um, but if you're in the U.S. or Canada, whatever, you want to call in and leave your comment. You'll call in, you'll hear me on the answering machine uh, telling you what to do, and you, you'll leave your comment or your question that you'll keep to about 30 seconds, and we're going to use it on the show. And we're actually going to do that today. I let the people who follow me on social media the other day, 
uh, know that we're going to be taking some calls. We're in a we're in a beta testing stage right now, and a whole bunch of you pho phoned in with questions. I've picked out five questions from uh, from the phone calls you guys sent in, and four questions we're going to take regular mailbag style. So I'm really excited about that. It's going to be really cool. We're going to be testing the phone call thing here today, and uh, watch for AMC mailbag daily starting in the next month or two so keep your eyes open for that all right so we're gonna get the mailbag questions now and I'm gonna start with a mailbag question that is not one singular question because I actually got about 40 or 50 emails from people uh, because this was a big we uh, week this past week was a big week in movie news if for no other reason then The Rock finally came out. Dwayne The Rock Johnson finally came out and said who he's going to be for Warner Brothers. Because we've known for a while he was going to be playing a superhero type character. We didn't know who it was going to be. Then we knew it was going to be something in the Shazam universe. And everybody just assumed it was going to be Shazam. I said all along, I said, he's going to be Black Adam. I'm telling you right now, The Rock is going to be Black Adam. And sure enough, this week he comes out and he says he's Black Adam. Now, what I got all the emails about, though, was... What came out the day after The Rock announced that he was going to play Black Adam was that Warner Brothers proper is not actually going to be producing the Shazam movie. That one of its sub uh, studios, New Line Cinema, New Line is actually going to be producing the Shazam film. And here's the interesting thing. Uh, we talked about this on uh, AMC Movie Talk. I think it was on Thursday. But the, the CEO, president of New Line, came out and said, <laughs> and I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but the gist of what he said was this. He said, you know, this is going to be a very different type of film. Shazam's not in Justice League. Um, Shazam is not uh, a Marvel character. It's going to be funny. It's going to be loose. It's going to be very different from the other DC movies and blah, 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 blah. And the very fact that, number one, it's not being produced by Warner Brothers. Number two... You got the, the head of the studio who is making it saying, you know, he's not part of Justice League. He's not a Marvel character. He's his own thing. He's, it's going to be fun and light and funny and stuff like that. Um, all those things led a lot of people to believe that Shazam, the Shazam movie with Black Adam, is not going to be a part of the DC cinematic universe that they've got going on with Batman and Superman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, and, and assumedly so Aquaman. Um, and it's got a lot of people believing that, and it's, I'm one of them. I'm one of the people that believes that this isn't going to be part of the same cinematic universe, which is something I never even considered prior to those comments. Now, we got about 30 or 40 mailbag questions that came in. I'm kind of, instead of just picking one, I'm kind of just joining them all in one big lump here. And in those emails, uh, a couple of people, number one, we got to bring two things up really clear. Number one, people saying, or assuming that that's a fact so people, because the way it's going around online in some circles is that Warner Brothers has announced that Shazam is not a part of the DC Cinematic Universe. Okay, so let's clear all that up right now. Warner Brothers has not announced that Shazam and Black Adam are not a part of the major, bigger DC Cinematic Universe. Okay, let's clear that up right now. No such official announcement of the kind has been made. Even though I believe that's kind of what they're hinting at, let's be real clear here. That is officially not the case, all right? So let's clear that up right now. There has been no official announcement from anybody at Warner Brothers, New Line, The Rock, anybody that is officially saying that Shazam is not a part of the DC Cinematic Universe. He very well may be. He may be in Justice League. He may be a part of the Justice League film. He may be a part of the larger cinematic universe, okay? Nothing official has said that he's not. Now, on the other side of the coin, <clears throat> I had a lot of people write into me and saying, well, you know, John, I mean, um, I, I think you're reading too much into it. Uh, just because he said it's going to be funny and whatever doesn't mean it's not uh, a part of the DC Cinematic Universe. A lot of people would write to me and say, well, John, just because New Line is producing it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's not a part of the larger DC Cinematic Universe. And I want to say to all those people who wrote to me, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Just because New Line is, say, is producing the film instead of Warner Brothers proper, and Warner Brothers proper is producing all the other DC movies, but 
just because New Line's producing it, that does not definitively say that Shazam is not a part of the DC Cinematic Universe. Just because there's that word going around that, you know, uh, that Warner Brothers wants its DC Cinematic Universe to, you know, no jokes, more serious, no tomfoolery, you know, that kind of stuff. And the New Line CEO saying that Shazam's going to be funny and fun and whatever, that you're right. That does not definitively mean that Shazam is not going to be part of the DC Cinematic Universe. You're absolutely right. All of you who wrote into me to say that just because A does not necessarily mean B, and I'm here to tell you you're all absolutely correct. I My position is simply this. <clears throat> if I had to put money on it, and I am not willing to put money on it, I'm my position right now is simply that when I look at those comments and the fact that when you bring it all together, that New Line is producing it, not Warner Brothers, that Warner Brothers seems to be going in a less silly tone, New Line CEO saying it's going to be more lighthearted. When you get the comments from the CEO saying he's not part of Justice League, he's not a Marvel character, he's kind of his own thing. When you take all that and put it all together, to me, it kind of points to that he's going to be in his own cinematic universe. Now, am I definitively saying I absolutely believe he's going to be that? No, I'm not. I think I still think it's a very real possibility that he is a part of the larger cinematic universe and people like me are just reading too much into these comments. That is absolutely a strong possibility. But if you said, John, right now, you got to bet $100, either $100 on that Shazam will be a part of the larger DC cinematic universe or $100 that this next movie will not be a part of the larger DC cinematic universe, then I'm going to put the money on not. I'm going to put the money on will not be a part of the larger DC Cinematic Universe. I'd rather not put money on it because, like I said, I still think it's a very strong possibility that he is. But to me, looking at all those you know, circumstances all together as one package, it kind of does make the suggestion to me that he's going to be separate. So it's going to be really interesting over the next little while as we sit back and watch this all kind of unfold uh, and see what happens. So let's keep our eyes on that. All right, well, with that, all those mailbag questions all conglomerated and put together out of the way, let's move on to the first ever call-in question on the phone. The first person to get their question on using the AMC uh, hotline. Let's get to it. It's a question, if I'm not mistaken, regarding Battlestar Galactica. So uh, let's check it out. Hey, John, uh, this is Justin. Uh, I was wondering, do you think with the Battlestar Galactica movie, that they're going to continue the story like they did with the TV show? Or are they going to reboot the entire thing? Thanks. Um, well, thanks a lot for calling in, Justin. Congrats on being like the first guy to do it. Um, okay, so for those of you who don't know, Battlestar Galactica, of course, a very popular series in the 70s and 80s, I think, uh, with Lauren Green, Dirk Benedict, um, who was the original Starbuck. Then in 2004, 2004, 2005, uh, came the rebooted reimagining of Battlestar Galactica with Edward James almost. Um, that was just, I'm going to tell you right now, that 2004 2005 Battlestar Galactica is my all time favorite television show. My favorite single season of television, I've said this before on the show, is season one of Heroes. To me, that is my all time single season of television. That was just, the show completely fell apart. Heroes completely fell apart after season one and it just got progressively worse and worse but that first season of heroes is my all-time single favorite season of television but my favorite show altogether um was battlestar galactica it, it was just such a brilliant reimagining um every episode it was thick with mythology and drama fantastic acting great action a really great balance of a limited budget yet producing some great you know, uh, sci-fi visuals and things like that. It was just everything you could hope a show would be. And it was the first show for me that I participated in viewing parties. It's like where every week was, okay, whose house are we going to this week to watch this episode of Battlestar Galactica? Who's coming over? We're ordering food, blah, blah, blah. We're like every single episode was an event. Now, I know other people have that for their shows, but that was the first one for me that I got so hyped about like a, a, a television show. Um, that I did that. And anyway, a couple of years ago came word that um, they want to do a Battlestar Galactica movie. 
So what Justin is asking is like, well, will, will this movie be a continuation? No, nah, it's not going to be a continuation. Um, if you watch the show, you know they brought that show to its conclusion. There's just no way to uh, do a continuation of the television show, show per se. So it's going to be another reimagining uh, in movie format. And instead of stretch over three seasons or five seasons or two seasons, whatever, it's going to be one contained uh, probably two, two and a half hour movie with an open door for sequels, obviously, because they'll, they'll want to turn it into a franchise. Now, um, one of the most interesting things about the Battlestar Galactica project was that Brian Singer, director of X-Men Days of Future Past, X-Men 1, X-Men 2, um, uh, Usual Suspects, uh, Superman Returns, um, Brian Singer was attached to develop and direct that Battlestar Galactica movie. Now, back in April... Word came out that Brian Singer had dropped out of the project. And if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think this was around that same time all those bogus, you know, uh, sexual assault charges came out that apparently have since all been dropped and pretty much proven false. And it's you got to feel bad. I mean, I, I said this from the beginning with the Brian Singer thing. I said, hey, look, if Brian Singer did all these things he's being accused of, to hell with him. Let him rot. Um... But I said, let's assume innocence until proven guilty. And, and, and if you followed that story, uh, more and more, as more and more facts came out, it became more and more evident that these were trumped up uh, false charges against him. And, and he and now apparently, if I understand the situation right, it's pretty much all been dropped and uh, everything's been let go. So uh, you got to feel good for Brian Singer. But anyway, I, I'm getting off on a tangent. Around April, if, the t if I'm thinking of the timing right, uh, that's around when all these uh, allegations started being made, and suddenly he dropped out of the project. So back in April, Brian Singer drops out of the project. Um, the interesting thing, though, is um, if you go to the Internet Movie Database Pro page, not the regular page, but the Internet Movie Database Pro page, it still lists, they still list um, Brian Singer as the director. Now, IMDb should never be taken as gospel. And even though IMDb Pro is more accurate, it should also not be taken as gospel. So just because IMDb Pro still has Brian Singer attached as the director of an upcoming Battlestar Galactica film, that does not necessarily mean it's 100% true. So take that with a grain of salt. I just found it interesting that he's still connected. Even though that announcement came out months ago that he wasn't on it anymore... I, I can't help but wonder if very quietly he kind of at some point got reattached. Or maybe I missed a news story altogether two months ago that they said he was coming back. And maybe I just missed that. I'm not sure. Let me know what you're thinking. Now, an interest, another interesting thing here is uh, uh, Jack uh, uh, Paglian. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. I believe the same dude who wrote Transcendence is still attached to write the script. But aside from that, haven't heard anything else about its progress. Haven't had heard anything else about where it is uh, in its development. Um, if indeed it is still officially happening. Now, I haven't heard anything to suggest that it's not happening anymore, but it has been very quiet on the Battlestar Galactica front. So um, that's everything that I know up to this point. And uh, if you guys know more, by all means, please leave a comment in the comment section and fill us in about what other information maybe you heard that I have not heard yet. That would be great. All right, let's move on to the second question today, which is an email question. And this email question today comes to us from Justin Wright. And Justin Wright writes in, Hello AMC Movie Talk. With the lowest grossing Spider-Man film to date with The Amazing Spider-Man 2, if Spider-Man was up for sale right now for Marvel, what would the sale price be? The LA Clippers were sold for $2 billion. Marvel sold for $4.5 billion. And Lucasfilm was sold for $4 billion to Disney. Is Spider-Man somewhere in the middle range right now, just below $4 billion? I think the price for Spider-Man right now might stand at around $3.8 billion. Thanks, and have a great day. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the question, Justin. One of the things I want to address, though, right up front. You know, a lot of people, and, and they're, they're accurate. They're accurate when they say this. But a lot of people right now are continuing to harp on this thing that, oh my gosh, Spider-Man 2, lowest grossing of the Spider-Man movies. Bad. It's in a bad way. It's in terrible, terrible rough shape. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 made over $700 million. Let me repeat that. The Amazing Spider-Man 2. That, in my opinion, other than, you know, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3, is the worst of the Spider-Man movies. 
I think The Amazing Spider-Man, I think Spider-Man 3, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is the worst of the Spider-Man movies. I think The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is the next worst of the Spider-Man movies. I enjoyed it. I did. But even though I enjoyed it, I can sit down with you and list off a huge laundry list of things that movie did wrong. Um, and I was disappointed. I wanted better out of that film. I know some people hated it. I did not hate it. I, I still found myself enjoying it. But when I walked out of the theater on that one, I was still disappointed. Um, and I think most people were generally disappointed. Uh, not a lot of people completely loved it. And some people did. Whatever. Um, but let's not go overboard here. Like every time about, oh my gosh, it's on a downward slide. Look, it made over $700 million at the box office. All right. It profited Sony hundreds of millions of dollars. Even after you take in marketing and production costs and, and the cut that the theaters take, even after you take all that in consideration, it is in the hundreds of millions of dollars of profit that Sony made on The Amazing Spider-Man 2. And so from this, this, this uh, narrative that people would create that, you know, without actually giving numbers, people create this narrative, oh my gosh, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, lowest grossing film of all the Spider-Man movies came this 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 weird narrative that Sony is now in trouble because of it, that now they're looking to unload Spider-Man and blah, 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 blah. It was amazingly profitable for Sony. They are not looking to unload Spider-Man. It, it made them a lot of profit. Uh, least of the ones yet, yep. But it still made over $700 million. Let's not lose sight of that. So, but the question that Justin is raising is a very interesting one, actually. That if it were for sale, like, let's just talk theoretically. If it were for sale, where would the price tag be? What would the price tag of it be? Okay, so let's assume that an average Spider-Man movie, like this last one made the least ever, and it made around, I think around $705 million, okay? But that was the lowest it's ever made. So let's, let's say for argument's sake, Let's draw a medium average that an expected Spider-Man film that's good is going to make around $750 million. Let's not go as high as eight. Let's not go at the lowest point of seven. Let's say $750 million. All right. Let's, for argument's sake, say you can put out three films in a five-year span. Whether it's And remember, Sony has plans to expand Spider-Man. Because now they're talking about a Sinister Six movie. They're talking about a Venom movie. They're talking about a female-led character out of the Spider-Man universe. They're talking about creating a Spider-Man cinematic universe. So let's, for argument's sake, say that uh, each film, and we're going low, is going to make $750 million at the Worldwide Box Office. And let's say in a five-year period, they can put out three of those. Then in that case, if you're talking about buying a property, some people say you value it at five years of revenue. Some people argue you should value something at seven years worth of revenue. But let's go low. Let's say five years revenue. Okay. So roughly speaking, we're talking around the neighborhood of like $2.2 billion. So I would suggest that if Sony was going to sell Spider-Man, right now in this very theoretical scenario um, that the sale price based on like say a rough guesstimate of a f of five years revenue then I'm going to say that you can roughly put it I rem I'm, remember I'm not a business major I'm just saying these are these are the little things that I've picked up and, and maybe you're somebody who knows it I'm completely wrong that's cool let me know please do I, I love to learn but uh, I think in very pr basic principles, talking about five years revenue, argument's sake, you can put out three films in a five-year period. Uh, so you're looking around $2.2 .2 billion. So, okay, $2.2 .2 billion is probably the fair market price for selling off uh, right now uh, an amazing Spider-Man franchise. Okay. But then this is what comes up all the time with these theoretical questions is, is it worth it to anybody to buy The Amazing Spider-Man for $2.2 billion? And I'm still going to say no. It ain't worth it. Look, let's take the, the prime uh, buyer that everybody wants to buy Spider-Man is Marvel Studios. I've brought this up before, but it bears repeating. Why would, it, why would Marvel want to spend $2.2 billion on Spider-Man? Why? What is the upside for them? They just put out Guardians of the Galaxy, an obscure title that nobody's ever heard of, 
But they had great story, great filmmakers, all that kind of stuff, and they captured lightning in a bottle, and they were able to make almost $500 million worldwide. And I guarantee you, the next Guardians of the Galaxy film is going to make nothing short of $800 million worldwide. Nothing short of $800 million. Now that everybody knows what it is, the next film is going to be huge. All right? So if they're putting that out and making tons of money, if they're putting out, if Ant-Man, I'm going to tell you right now, Ant-Man's going to make tons of money. If Ant-Man is making tons of money, if their Captain America films are making tons of money, if Thor is making them tons of money, if the Avengers are making them tons of money, if Iron Man continues to make record-breaking tons of money, if everything that Marvel puts out is putting making tons and tons of money and they already own the rights to all, all of those, why? Why spend $2.2 billion to get another character when you don't need him? You don't need him. Because now, not only do you have to spend $200 million to make a Spider-Man film and market it, you got to spend $2.2 million just to get the rights to make that film. And I, I, my position has always been, and I believe Kevin Feige's position, is we don't need Spider-Man. If Marvel was struggling, or let's say Guardians of the Galaxy came out and it flopped, and then Ant-Man comes out and it flopped, and... The inevitable Doctor Strange movie comes out and it's and it doesn't do so great. And the inevitable Black Panther comes out and it doesn't do so great. If that was the scenario, if that was the narrative, if Captain America Winter Soldier came out and it only made it, it didn't do well. If that was the narrative, then you're in a situation where, you know what, Marvel could really use a home run hitter like a Spider-Man character. Break out that checkbook. Get him in because we need it. Because Marvel needs it. Marvel needs that infusion. We need that big home run hitting character that we know will be a hit to hopefully revitalize all these other lagging properties that we have. If that was the scenario and if that was the narrative, then Marvel, it becomes a more realistic proposition for Marvel to say it is worth it to us. We need to spend this $2.2 billion to go out, get Spider-Man and bring him into the Marvel fold. But that's not the narrative. That's not the situation we're in. Captain America the Winter Soldier was a huge hit. Guardians of the Galaxy is a monstrous hit, especially considering what it is. And it's just going to continue to make more and more money as you build sequels around it. Doctor Strange is going to be a hit. Ant-Man's going to be a hit. Black Panther is going to be a hit. Thor 3 is going to be a hit. The, the, the next time they do a Hulk film, it's going to be a hit. When they eventually do Iron Man 4, it's going to be a massive hit. Avengers 2, is there anybody doubting it's going to be a massive hit? The environment that Marvel's in right now is they don't need it. So why pointlessly and uselessly write a check for $2.2 billion to go out and get a character that you simply do not need? And right now, they don't even have room for. Look, as a fan, would I love to see um, Spider-Man in Avengers, of course I would. Just like anybody else, we'd all love to see it. Would that be cool to see? Yes. But I'm going to echo the sentiments of John Schnepp. When John Schnepp says, you know, it's better for us fans to have Spider-Man in another property. Because let's face it, aside from, from The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and aside from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3, the other three Spider-Man films have been great. They've all been great. And there's simply no time, no room, no whatever. If he, if he gets, if Spider-Man came over to Marvel right now, I just think he would disappear. But now I'm getting into arguments I've made before. So anyway, that's that's my personal opinion. So you know, theoretically, if he were to sell, I think it would be for $2.2 billion. But I don't think Sony is looking to sell because we forget, although it is the lowest grossing Spider-Man film, it has made over $700 million. And even though Spider-Man would be cool to have in Marvel, there is simply no incentive for Marvel to want to pay that kind of money to bring in a character they simply don't need right now. So... That's kind of the way. But I know a lot of you will have a lot of very different opinions on that. Phone on in to the AMC. I'll bring that up again. Well, That's a good segue. To the AMC mailbag hotline, 818-934-0228. And leave your comment on why you think I'm right, why you think I'm wrong. It's maybe something I'm not taking into consideration. Or leave your thoughts in the comments section below for that. I know this is going to be a hot topic. All right. Let's move on to the next uh, phone-in question we have, and this one uh, pertains to that uh, Tom Hardy film, Locke. Let's uh, take a listen. Hey, 
Hello, my name is Alan Rochez. Uh, I met you, a lot of you guys at Comic Con. I just wanted to say, um, I wanted to ask if you have seen, if any of you have seen, I'm not sure if you've seen Locke um, with uh, Tom Hardy. And if you did, uh, did you really, really, really like it, or was it okay? And that's my question. Thanks, guys. Bye. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the question, man. Um, yes, I have seen Locke. You might have heard us talk about Locke a couple times. The new Tom Hardy film. It's not so new anymore. Uh, it's a small in indie uh, Tom Hardy film um, directed uh, by Steve Knight. Not to be confused with Stephen DeKnight, who is the creator of Spartacus. Two very different people. Um, and it's incredible. It's Tom Hardy's best performance ever. Uh, more than uh, Bronson, more than you know anything else you've seen him in. Tom Hardy in Locke is the best performance he's ever, ever given. Now, Locke is a lot like that Ryan Reynolds film that was out a couple years ago, Buried. Do you remember Buried? I loved Buried. I thought it was just incredible. It showed what a true acting talent Ryan Reynolds is. Buried um, is about this dude who wakes up in a coffin buried seven feet underground. And all he has is his kid. He doesn't know how he got there, and he's got a cell phone in there that was left in there with him so the people put in there can communicate with him. And the entire movie of Buried takes place in the box. Never is that movie outside of the box. It's always just Ryan Reynolds in the box. And if you're going to do a movie, an hour and a half movie, of just a guy in a box, you got to have an incredible story to tell. you got to be really creative as a filmmaker. And you have to have an incredible performance from your lead. Well, <coughs> Locke is... A lot like that in many ways. It's not as claustrophobic um, as Buried, but it's it's about this dude. Locke is his last name, and the whole movie takes place with him driving in his car. That's the whole movie. Um, I, I don't want to give too much away, but basically something comes up. He's he's like a construction supervisor. He's got this big project going on. His wife and his family thing. So the only thing that happens in this movie is him in this car and and the various people he talks to on the phone. But something comes up that creates a moral dilemma for him, and he makes a decision that he needs to drive to go be with this one woman uh, for something. I won't give away why. And the whole movie is just Tom Hardy in the car driving. That's the whole movie. And they shot the entire movie, I believe, in eight nights. They shot completely unedited. They just shot like the only time they would stop shooting was because the memory cards on the digital cameras they were using would run out every 27 minutes. So they would stop, change all the memory cards and the three cameras, and then keep going. And they would do that, and they did that for, for eight nights, and they shot it all in eight days. And it's just amazing. If you Look, obviously it's not a big actioneer, it's not a big whatever, but man, if you like Tom Hardy, or if you're just a fan of great, great performances, this is Tom Hardy at his best. It, it's him at his absolute best. And so I highly recommend. I think Locke might be... If it's not on Netflix right now, it's on Amazon Prime. Uh, or maybe not Prime, but you should be able to rent it on Amazon regardless. So I, I really highly recommend. If you've not seen Locke, go give it a shot. All right, let's mix, uh, let's mix in another mailbag question that comes in. And this question comes to us from Corey. And Corey writes... Hey, AMC family. I love the show and I catch it every day. Thanks so much, Corey. We appreciate your support, man. Uh, my question is, with regards to how the show works on a daily basis, what time do you guys slash gals generally get to the studio? Uh, how is it decided who will sit on the panel each day? Um, how are the topics decided upon? And finally, do you have a run-through before you go live for the day? Uh, well, thanks a lot, Corey. I like taking questions like this on Mailbag. I like talking about behind-the-scenes stuff. Um... Okay, so on a general AMC movie talk day, here's how it basically works. Let's start with who do, how do we decide who's on the schedule. Well, we have a, a crew of about 10 people. And uh, I mean, I know I'm going to forget somebody's name. We got Ashley is a host. Uh, Chris Lee's one of our hosts. Uh, obviously, Amy Rose, Dennis, uh, John Schnepp, uh, Christian Harloff, uh, uh, Mary Jedekin, Alicia Malone. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I, think, I think I covered all the... Ashley, <laughs> I think I got everybody there. Anyway, and so um, everybody's on a different amount. John Schnepp is on three days a week. Generally speaking, Schnepp is on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays uh, because he has other things he's got to do. He can't be on Movie Talk every single day. 
Uh, and sometimes, you know, if he's, he's got to be out of town on a Tuesday, then he'll do a Thursday as well. But generally speaking, Schnepp does three days a week. Uh, Amy Rose generally does two days a week. So does Dennis. Uh, uh, right now, Christian does two days a week. Uh, Miri and Alicia have also been doing two days a week, but they are going to be cutting back to one day a week each. And you will find out why in the coming months. Anyway, um, <coughs> So we have a schedule and uh, Amy Rose puts together the schedule knowing that, you know, who does how many days per week. And she puts puts together a schedule for the show and uh, includes special guests. You know, we've got like the great Jermaine Luci uh, uh, Lucier. We got, um, you know, where the great Drake comes in, uh, Jimmy O. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of people who are regular guests that come in and Tiffany Smith has been a guest. Mark Ellis has been a guest, you know, all that kind of stuff. So she scheduled. That's how we schedule who's going to be on. Now, as far as a regular day's flow and how do we decide what topics get covered, um, you've heard me talk about this. My day starts at about 5, 5 in the morning. And the first thing I do when I get up is I just read all the, the, the news wires. I just read all the news sources. And I start to pick out, you know, if it's a regular news day, I'll pick out about 12 potential stories, Right after reading all the news sources. And then what I'll do is I'll go through those 12 and I'll, we need to narrow that down to five. Two main topics, three buy and sells. So I whittle that down to the top five subjects. And then <clears throat> I get uh, uh, certain mailbag questions forwarded onto me and I'll select out of the ones that get forwarded onto me. So well, generally speaking, a normal AMC movie talk will have two main topics, three buy and sells, two mailbag questions, and then live questions from the Twitter uh, audience. So from there, I start writing the show notes uh, together and basically what the hosts will read. So what Ashley and Chris Lee will read off as the main story and communicating the information of the story be before me and the rest of the panel start commenting on it. Now, I have to have those show notes done by about 8 or 8.15 in the morning. That, so that, all that has to be done by 8.15 in the morning. Because 8, 8 to 8.15, I need to send out those show notes to everybody involved in the show that day so they can start preparing what they want to do and say. But more importantly, I need to send those show notes to Dennis and his production team um, because, and you know, once Ray was our, our uh, assistant production person, now Jonathan is our assistant production person. So I have to send that out because they have to look at the show notes and start pulling together the graphics that we're going to need. Uh, they have to start putting together the, the uh, log sheet. They have to start putting together the mailbag. If we need, if there are certain quotes, because you know in the show, if The Rock said the following, blah, 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 and we bring up the quote, right? They have to also have to put those quote graphics together. And they have to have all that done by 9.30, because at 9.30, all the graphics, the show notes, the whole package has to be shipped off to the studio. So we normally, we shoot the show at 11 a.m., uh, and we normally roll into the studio somewhere between 10.30 and 10.45. And the last part of your question was, do we do a run-through of the show? And my answer is absolutely not. No. Actually, that's a very firm rule of mine. No run-through. And no talking about the story. So, like, let's say me, Schnepp, and Dennis are on the show one day, right? So we all show up, and let's say, you know, The Rock has announced that he's Black Adam. Okay. We will not talk. We'll talk about everything we did last night. We'll talk about anything else. But we do not talk about what the stories are that day. Because when I want to hear what Schnepp has to say about that for the first time when we're recording. Because I want to react to him in a real way. And I want Dennis to hear my opinion for the first time as we're shooting. Because I want his reaction to my thoughts to be live and real. Right, So we do not run through, we do not rehearse, we do not talk about the topics whatsoever until the cameras start to roll. Um, and then once the show is, is done streaming live, we make any little adjustments to it that we need to, we re-upload it, and it's usually online and ready to be viewed around 1.30 in the afternoon Los Angeles time, so 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. So um, yeah, that is the regular show flow for what we do with AMC Movie News. I hope you find that helpful. All right, let's get on to the next call-in question. This one has to do with a couple of my favorite movies in the last few years. Let's take a listen. All right, my name is Anthony Williams, and my question is simple. In 2012, John Campia said that his favorite movie of the year was Les Miserables, and in 2013, he said his favorite movie was 12 Years a Slave. 
So my question is simple. Wh- which, is, which is your favorite film between Les, Les Miserables and 12 Years a Slave? Thanks, and keep up the amazing work, and keep bringing the filthy. Okay, bye. All right, well, thanks so much for the question. Um, I, I don't know that my all-around favorite 2012 film was Les Mis. It might be. It was certainly my favorite to win the Oscar that year. I wanted it to win Best Picture. Uh, I don't know that 12 Years a Slave was my favorite film of 2013. It depends on the day you ask me, I guess. But it was my pick and my hope for it to win the Oscar that year. Uh, so it's a great question. So out of those two years, back-to-back, Le Mis or um, 12 Years a Slave? Look, 12 Years a Slave is a, no doubt, it is a powerful film with incredible performances. Actually, I thought um, Chiwetel Ejiofor... As much as I loved Matthew McConaughey and Dallas Buyers Club, and I have no qualms with McConaughey winning the Oscar that year, no qualms with it at all. I'm simply saying, if it were my vote, I would have given it to Chiwetel Ejiofor for 12 Years a Slave. That's just me. Um, And, of course, uh, you know, it did win Oscars and stuff like that. There were multiple great performances in the film. But I'm going to have to pick Les Mis, man. Les Mis exceeded every single expectation I had for it. It it was so utterly powerful and uh, emotional and it drew you in and, you know, it just showed dimensions. I mean, Hugh Jackman. I mean, we talk about range sometime. Hugh Jackman is Wolverine and he's Jean Valjean. You know, he's killing all these guys in his berserker rage and... He's singing his guts out, you know, on like, like, and it was just such, so incredible, so incredible. And that, I mean, my goodness, Anne Hathaway, just that scene of her doing, I dreamed a dream. Like, I, and I can't remember if it was all in one shot. If it wasn't all in one shot, a lot of it was one shot. Um, it was just mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. Um, such a richly deserved Oscar that she won for that that performance. So, uh, if you're going to ask me, uh, out of the two, 12 Years a Slave or Les Miserables, I'm going to say I, I got to go with Les Mis. But I'd like to know what you guys think. Let me know in the comments section below. All right, let's move on to the next mailbag question. And this one comes to us emailed in from Anton Jones, who writes, Greetings and salutations, sons and daughters of AMC. I know that the website Rotten Tomatoes uh, is affiliated with AMC, so I thought who better to answer my question regarding the meaning of their ratings. What is the difference between the percentage rating on the tomato meter and the average rating listed below the percentage rating? For instance, Guardians of the Galaxy received a 92% rating, but only a 7.7 out of 10 average rating. Thanks, and keep bringing the filthy. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Anton, and let me clarify something first. Um, AMC is not affiliated with Rotten Tomatoes in any way, shape, or form, other than we have the fact that we have their senior editor, Gray Drake, is a friend of ours and is on the show every once in a while. Other than that, we have no affiliation with Rotten Tomatoes at all. Um, <laughs> that being said, all right. There are two different ratings you can get on, uh, on Rotten Tomatoes regarding things. And let me clear something up here, too, because it, it still amazes me how many people don't understand this about Rotten Tomatoes. Some people will say to me, it's like, I don't trust Rotten Tomatoes because they gave this movie a this rating. Okay, well, then you don't understand what Rotten Tomatoes is. Rotten Tomatoes does not give a rating to anything. Rotten Tomatoes does not give a score to any movie. All Rotten Tomatoes does, for those of you who may not know, um, is they collect hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reviews by different critics from the online world, newspapers, television, whatever. They gather all of this huge, wide, vast um, sampling of different movie critics from different mediums, different locations, different walks of life, different ages, different whatever. Takes all of them and then gathers them up and then looks at what they scored the movie and Rotten Tomatoes simply collects the average. Rotten Tomatoes does not give ratings. They simply collect the ratings. That's all they do. Now, there are two separate scores that you can get. There's the um, out of 10 score, which basically says, okay, this guy gave it a 5, this guy gave it a 6. If these were the only two people... Or let, let's say this. Let's say there were only two movie critics in the world, okay? One guy gave... Um, 
let's pick a movie right now. Let's say Guardians of the Galaxy, right? One critic gave Guardians of the Galaxy a 7. One gave Guardians of the Galaxy an 8. So the average score out of 10 then is a 7.5. So instead of just two critics, they do that for like 250 critics. <clears throat> and they figure, okay, this guy, uh, we uh, he gave it a 4 out of 5. That roughly equates to an 8 out of 10. So we'll count that as an 8 out of 10. And then this guy's this. And, then, yeah, yeah. and it averages it out to what uh, en masse the critics give it. Now, the more popular rating, though, on Rotten Tomatoes, and, and quite frankly, the one I pay more attention to, the one that I think is more valuable to look at, is the tomato meter. And what the tomato meter is, is it simply says, out of all these hundreds of critics, how many of them like the movie and would recommend it, as opposed to how many did not like the movie and would not recommend it. So, <clears throat> let's say you had Guardians of the Galaxy, and... 100 critics saw it and and uh, and gave it a review. And out of those 100 critics, 85 out of those 100 gave Rotten Tomatoes or gave uh, Guardians of the Galaxy a positive review. And what Rotten Tomatoes considers a positive review is they would give it a 6 out of 10 or higher. Not a 5 out of 10 or higher, a 6 out of 10 or higher. Um, so Rotten Tomatoes looks says, out of these 100 critics, how many of them gave it a thumbs up, a positive review, a recommendation that, yes, you should go see this movie. And if 85 out of 100 um, gave it positive reviews, then the score would be 85%. Then that would become the Rotten Tomatoes meter score of 85%. And me personally, I find that to be the better metric. Um, I find that to be the better way of looking at it because... Um, Various people can skew scores, right? So you get somebody to give Guardians Galaxy a 1 out of 10. Well, okay, 1 out of 10. If you had three critics, one of them gave it a 1 out of 10, and two of them gave it 8 out of 10. Well, that one guy who gave it a 1 out of 10 is really going to drag down that average, that average out of 10. Um, and so <clears throat> I like the pureness of just saying, this is a good movie, you should see it, or this is a bad movie, you shouldn't. What percentage of critics said this? Because remember, I, I, I preach on this all the time. A lot of people look at movie critics and they think they're all the same. They're all these stuffy, white, old men and blah, who, who go in with their pad of paper and pencil and write out their deep thoughts. But movie critics couldn't be a more diverse, different group of lunatics you've ever met in your life. I mean, because you'll get a guy... Like, uh, I don't know, let's say uh, James Rocky, formerly of MSN Movie News. Now he writes reviews for like Variety and a lot of other different places. James Rocky, a very, uh, he's a gentleman. His glasses, his suit, his tie. Fellow Canadian kid, by the way. <coughs> and he has a certain way about himself that is different from everybody else. So you got James Rocky. Now you get Jimmy O, who you've seen on our show many times. James Oster. You know, with the Mohawk and, you know, the great or not Grateful Dead, uh, the, the Night of the Living Dead t-shirt and blah, blah, blah. Both of those guys are film critics that Rotten Tomatoes counts their score. And so you get this, you get Peter Serretta from, from um, Slash Film. He's a totally different cat. Totally different dude from Kofi from Screen Rant. They're totally different people. <laughs> and so now you guys, uh, so now you got this. You know, James Rocky, James Oster, the Mohawk wearing whatever guy. You got this guy, all completely different people. Men, women, young, old, rockers, classic, suit wearers, you know, you know, tank top wearing. You know, all these different guys, right? And if you tell me that all out of all them, 90% of that vastly different group of people with totally different life experiences and different preferences and different styles and different whatever... You tell me that 90% of that eclectic group of psychopaths, 90% of them said they like this movie and would recommend it? That tells me more than a 6.8 out of 10 average or a 8.9 out of 10 average. Just that's why to me that, that tomato meter metric is to me the most valuable metric out there. Now, is it? Oh, do I always agree with it? You know I don't. You know that I don't always agree with it. Superman Returns. I, or not Superman Returns, Man of Steel, I think is not a good, I think it is a brilliant film. 
brilliant. I love that movie. That's a 9 out of 10 movie for me. But it, but for the tomato meter, it roughly got around 50%, which, I mean, a little higher than 50%. I think it was 56 or something like that, which means just barely the majority of the critics would say, yes, I like this film and I re would recommend it. I thought a lot more of them should. So do I always agree with Rotten Tomatoes and what that collection of the, the universe of film critics says? Obviously not, but you shouldn't expect to because film critics are a hugely diverse group of people with different things. So that's why I always tell people when they say, what should I look for in critics? Say, look for a critic, look for a couple of critics, get a handful of critics, three or four of them that you really like, the way they communicate, not that you always agree with, but you like the way they analyze film and you know by listening to them, you get a good sense from listening to them whether you will like a film or not. Not necessarily whether they liked a film or not, but whether you liked a film or not. But anyway, that's why I think that that Rotten Tomatoes meter is is probably the best and the most valuable um, um, you know analytic that we have out there for stuff like this. All right, let's take another call. And uh, this call comes in about one of my favorite uh, cartoon franchises of all time, actually. Let's take a listen. Hi, this is Kyle uh, Suggs from Greensboro, North Carolina. Love the show. My question is, you mentioned about Star Blazers being a possible uh, movie and was wondering, had you heard anything about that? Uh, thanks for uh, in advance and um, enjoy your show. Bye-bye. All right, well, thanks a lot for the question. Sorry that I messed it up there for a second. Yes, yeah, Star Blazers, man. Star Blazers. I don't know if you guys have been watching long enough for when they first kind of announced that they were looking at making a Hollywood North American uh, version of Star Blazers because I nearly jumped out of my skin. I was so excited. I used to watch uh, the old <coughs> um, uh, Japanese cartoon was called Space Battleship Yamato. And the, basically the story of Star Blazers or Space Battleship Yamato is that the Earth is being attacked by this alien race that is just bombarding the Earth with these uh, like uh, radiation-filled asteroids. And they're basically making the earth unlivable. So humanity has to literally live, move underground. And they live underground away from the radiation. But time is running out because radiation is starting to seep through uh, the, the earth and <laughs> get down to where they live. And they've only got like a year left to survive before the radiation reaches the population of the earth that now lives underground. So they devise um, this strategy. They get a message from another alien race that says, we want to save you. We have a device that will clean all the radiation off your planet. But the trick is you've got to get to us to get it and bring it back home. And they've got one year to do it. So what humanity does is they take the old World War II battleship Yamato and retrofit, I know this sounds ridiculous, but they retrofit it into a space battleship. And so this crew known as the Star Blazers, uh, led by, I'm not kidding, the, the lead character in it is a guy by the name of Wildstar. I, who names these guys? I have no idea. And his love interest was Nova. Anyway, so they, this whole crew, they got to now take this ship and fly off um, and fight the enemy along the way in all these big epic battles. Now, there was a live action um, uh, Japanese version made, I believe in like either 2009, 2010, something like that. It looked a little bit like a video game to me. A lot. I know a lot of people really love it, though. You might be interested in it. Check it out. You can find parts of it on YouTube. Look up Space Battleship Yamato movie, um, and you'll probably find some of the, the, the clips, if not the whole movie, on, on YouTube. But anyway, um, and I've been super psyched about the idea of, of a Hollywood version of it. I, I think it would be fantastic. I think it would be great. Now, I don't know where it is in its development right now because you haven't heard a lot. I do know this, that the main guy that was attached... Uh, to direct to direct it, and I believe write it too, is a dude by the name of Christopher McQuarrie. And Christopher right now is Tom Cruise's golden child. Christopher just directed, um, or he's about to direct, Mission Impossible 5. He wrote Jack Reacher, which I thought was a very, very good script. But he wrote Day After Tomorrow as well, which, as you know, I love Day After Tomorrow. Or Edge of Tomorrow, I mean. Edge of Tomorrow. Very different movie from Day After Tomorrow. Uh, Edge of Tomorrow, the Tom Cruise film. So he worked with Tom Cruise on Jack Reacher. He worked with him on Edge of Tomorrow. Now he's directing Mission Impossible 5. Uh, I really like this guy's sensibilities. I haven't seen him direct anything yet because Mission Impossible 5 has not come out yet. But I'm really looking forward to seeing um, what he does with that. So... <clears throat> How much is it moving right now? I'm not really sure. This is a lot like the Battlestar Galactica scenario. It's been announced. It's got this really talented dude attached to it. But that dude is kind of working on Mission Impossible 5 right now. So 
I'm not sure how far along they are in the, in the process. Let's wait an, another, pardon me, let's wait another two years or so. Because, you know, big projects like this, these can take five, six, seven years to gestate. Um, especially when it's going to cost big money. This is going to be a big budget movie. This is easily going to be a $150 million plus movie. So it's, they're going to take their time with it. And let's um, let's kind of see where they end up. I Man, I really hope it comes to fruition, though, because I'm dying to see this movie. All right. Uh, I believe this is our last mailbag question for the day. So the next mailbag question comes to us from Bobby Singh, who writes... Um, hi guys, my question uh, isn't about a movie, but the movie critic circle itself. I just wondered how much an actor actually takes note of a critique, and if you guys have been careful about what you say sometimes. For example, Vin Diesel sang your praises recently, and there's clearly a mutual respect with AMC. I'm wondering, if his next performance is a pile of poop, will you uh, be as forthcoming with your critique, or will you ease off a bit, uh, bearing in mind any future meetings, interviews with him? Great show, guys. Um, for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, I did a uh, Guardians of the Galaxy interview with Vin Diesel, and he's totally surprised me by kind of hijacking the interview, and talk, and he just talked for like a minute on our interview. You can find it. It's on our, it's on our AMC channel. Just look up... Uh, AMC, Vin Diesel, Guardians of the Galaxy. You should find our interview with him. And he just goes off about how much he loves AMC Movie Talk and, uh, and how much he likes me and all that kind of stuff. And what, what really impressed me um, and, and humbled me about that was he knows I have not always been, and he brought this up, he knows I've not always been real complimentary about Vin Diesel. Like, when he does stuff that excites me, I, I'm really excited about it. I think he did great in this. I think uh, the way he's doing this, this, and this, I think it looks awesome, blah, blah, blah. But when he's turned in stuff and done stuff that I haven't thought was been so smart, I've said it. And knowing that, um, he's still complimentary anyway. And my wife just came in. She's closing my door because she doesn't want to hear me talk, much like you guys probably don't want to hear me talk. Anyway, um, but that part impressed me even more. The fact that he knows I haven't been always complimentary, but he knows I'm always going to be honest. There, before the internet days, a lot of uh, I have a good friend of mine who was an who was like the entertainment editor for Time Magazine, and she said they had a very hard and fast rule. And a lot of publications had this rule: the person who reviews the movies is not ever going to be the same person that interviews the celebrities. Those always have to be two separate people, for for really good reason, right? Because, you know, if you're interviewing the star, that might influence you, at least at the time was, it could influence you about how you review their movie. And um, I think those lines have been blurred more, and I don't think that's as big of a concern anymore, but it was a really good, you know, church and state separation that old-style publications used to have. But I, honestly, for me, no, I, I, really, don't, I really don't care. I, I always, I'm going to say what I think. Here's a good example. Um, a good friend of mine is a, is a director in town here. Um, and um, I'll tell you, his, his name's Brian Taylor. And he's one of the guys who wrote and directed Crank 1, Crank 2. I love the Crank movies. Um, he also wrote and produced Pathology, which you know I liked. I like Pathology. But he also did Gamer. Um, and I, I did not love Gamer. I thought it was okay. I thought Gamer was okay. And then he did Ghost Rider 2. And I, look, uh, Brian is a friend of mine. He's actually one of the guys. Uh, Brian, Mark, and Milo are the guys who actually are responsible for me meeting my wife. They're responsible for me being introduced to my wife. Um, so I owe them a lot in many, many, many ways. But Ghost Rider 2 sucked. And I got to say it. It doesn't matter that he's a friend of mine. It don't matter. I got to be honest. Guardians of the, or not Guardians of the Galaxy, um, uh, Ghost Rider 2 was terrible. It was a terrible movie. Um, it doesn't matter that I really loved other movies that he made. It doesn't matter that he introduced me to my wife. It doesn't matter that he's a friend of mine. Ghost Rider 2 sucked, and I gotta say it. So, if a guy like that is a friend of mine and introduced me to my wife, just because Vin Diesel was nice to me one day doesn't mean I'm gonna be any less impartial when I talk about his next movie. I can't. Because if I did, that shoots any credibility I have. Any credibility I have is gone. So I, I hope when people, you know, hear me talking about a movie, look, I, I wanted to love Transformers 4, but I didn't. So I can't come on here and say that I did. 
you know, some people, some people still think, oh, John, uh, John is just going to say what AMC tells him to say. Uh, no, no, I do not. Uh, there have been many, um, I, I don't know how far I want to go into it. Nobody at AMC will ever tell me what to say. Let's just say that. Um, but if they were, you don't think they want me hyping up Transformers 4? The big blockbuster, whatever? You don't think AMC would love it if I was getting on saying, everybody should run out and go see, I just saw Transformers 4, and it's amazing. You should all go get your tickets for it. Wah! It's a bag of crap. That movie sucks. And, uh, and I've got to be honest about it. Because if I'm not honest about it, I have no credibility. And I think the same thing comes true about, yeah, sometimes i got to go interview th these celebrities. I don't do it that much myself anymore. Um, now I, I let uh, a lot of the other staff do it, whether it's Amy Rose or, or uh, Miri or, or Chrissy, whoever. I let them go and do it. Um, but, uh, but even if it's the case, look, if a movie's good, I'm going to say it's good. It doesn't matter if I don't like the actor in it. If a movie's bad, I'm going to say it's bad. It doesn't matter if I do like the actor in it. Because I don't know how to be any different. So that's just the way we do things. All right, guys. This has gone, has gone on way longer than I thought. But I do have uh, one more uh, phone-in question today. So we're going to take that last phone-in question. So this one, I think, has to do with about budgets in Hollywood. Hey, this is Brock Emmerich. Hello, everybody at AMC Crew. My question is, have you ever seen a movie where you couldn't quite figure out where the budget went? You talked about how you could tell where every cent went in the Pacific Rim in your review. I was just kind of wondering if there was a movie where it boggles your mind where you could not see where the money was spent. Have a nice day, guys. Bye. Um, yeah, that's a great question. They, they, you watch Pacific Rim and you realize that the, the movie only had a certain budget. Still huge by many standards, but, but modest by big blockbuster standards. And you can see every penny on the screen. So it's a great question that he's asking. He's asking, you know, have you ever seen a movie where you're wondering where the heck did they spend all this money? The one film that will, that probably, it's recent, but will always now forever come into my head is The Lone Ranger. They spent, depending on who you believe, anywhere between 225 and $275 million making that movie. 200, let's go with the bottom end of that. Let's just say 225. $225 million to make that movie. Where? Somebody tell me where the hell that money went. You know, unless it was $50 million for, Do for Johnny Depp, $5 million for Army Hammer, and $55 million for Johnny Depp's daily makeup. I, I mean, I don't know. I am, I'm lost. I'm flabbergasted um, when I look at a film like that and realize how much it costs to make, and it should not. That should have been a $45 million movie. And even if you like The Lone Ranger, and this has nothing to do with how good or bad the movie is, and it's a bad movie, but it has nothing to do with that. Even if you love The Lone Ranger, you got to admit, when you watch that film, you, you probably think this is probably a 40 to $50 million budget film. Where the $200 plus million dollars went, I have no idea. Other than the producers maybe just thought, eh, it's a Disney film, we'll write whatever check we want. I mean, you can't do that. And I think... You know, Jerry Bruckheimer, look, everybody thinks Disney just throws money around. They don't. They are tight on their money. They're very smart about their money. And that's part of the reason I think that Jerry Bruckheimer and Disney don't have their deal anymore. It's because, like, there's no way that movie should have cost that much. Some other ones, Quantum of Solace, the James Bond film. Once again, forget the fact that it was a little bit of a disappointing film. That movie should not cost have cost north of $200 million to make. No way. Another one... Um, is a movie I like very, very much, that 2010 animated film Tangled, the Rapunzel movie. Wonderful movie. $260 million to make. Let's put that in, in perspective. Um, Toy Story 3 cost $200 million to make. That's $60 million cheaper. WALL-E cost $180 million to make. That's $80 million cheaper. Now, you can read the story about um, Tangled. There's some interesting stories about it had a lot of development hell. Uh, them just trying to create the software to do her hair right cost a lot. But, I mean, $260 million. I mean, that that's another one that you sit down and watch. And you go, okay, this movie shouldn't have cost $260 million to make. But, man, I'm telling you, The Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger for me will always be the poster child of films that just cost way more than necessary to make. 
All right, folks, that will do it for me for this very long installment of AMC Mailbag. Thank you for putting up with me as, as, as we are in the beta stages. I'm trying to work out the bugs about bringing in the phone calls and all that kind of stuff. So thank you for bearing, bearing with me and being with me here today. Don't forget, lots of great films playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater show time and, of course, your movie ticket information. And, of course, send in your mailbag questions. Email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. And, of course, now, just if you're watching this on Saturday... Okay, please, only if you're watching this on Saturday. If you'd like to try calling in and getting your phone question on for tomorrow's mailbag show on Sunday, go on in and try calling us at the hotline at 818-934-0228. I hope you guys do that, and uh, hopefully we can get your question on the show. So that'll do it for me. My name's John Campion for AMC Mailbag and AMC Movie News and all this great stuff. Thanks for joining me, and until next time, bye-bye.